Who hosts the radio show? Mike Stedham. Is he a fighter? Yeah. Well, he owned the gym that I originally started at. Okay. So he reached out to me to have me come. They do MMA gym. too? MMA no, boxing? He was a, he's an old school. He's So he basically was doing kickboxing way back in the day. Okay. And he was a world champ. So like when MMA got big, everybody wanted to learn kickboxing from yeah. him. So. Is this during like Horse Gracie time in his prime or is this like 80s, like before even that? No, I mean, he, he would have been a good fighter back in the mid-90s probably. Okay. But he was still more kind of doing the kickboxing thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, well, you know, this is Eric Whalen. You oh, know. Are we on right now? Yeah, we're on. I oh, wanted to just keep, right. I just wanted to keep talking just yeah. to get you comfortable, you know. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, man, just t- tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, and um How'd you get into fighting? Right. You know, and um, just how it all started. Yeah, I mean, the easy answer is wrestling. Wrestling got me into this. I started wrestling when I was, I was in Little League stuff back in elementary school. It wasn't very serious. It was just Little League programs. But that, of course, got into junior high. That's where wrestling got serious. After after junior high, high school, I was doing the full uh, year-round wrestling, doing the freestyle, the Greco. Um, mm. That's the type of wrestling they do in the Olympics. A lot of people don't know that, but that's there's folk style, freestyle, and Greco okay. wrestling. Um, and then I, out of high school, I went on a mission uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then after that, I came home, got married, and I figured I'd just work a regular old nine to five. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, that marriage didn't work. And when you're going through the mm-hmm. chaos of a divorce... I needed to do something, and, and fighting was the answer. And so yeah. I got into fighting. That so you took a break? You took a short little break because you, you grew up fighting. Yeah. One of your missions, you took a little break. You was trying to do the family thing. Yeah, there was about six years between the two-year mission, about four years of marriage. Okay. And then I got into it after the divorce. What were you so. doing during, like, the marriage? Like, what were you doing for work if you weren't fighting? I was, I was a truck driver. I was still competing in freestyle and Greco wrestling tournaments. I yeah. kind of had this, like... Oh, maybe I could be an Olympic wrestler. Yeah. Uh, and I was pretty good, but like, I don't think I would have ever been an Olympic wrestler. Okay. But it was fun to think about. It was fun to compete. Yeah. So I still was training while I was married, but not aggressively what you would need to do to be like a pro MMA. Okay. So. So I listened to your audio book twice. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then from your audiobook, I can tell you more than just a wrestler. From from what I understand is that you play sports show entire life. Yeah. Like so, what course. what are what are the things that you do outside of um, fighting? Because I know that's that, that's one of the things they emphasize on even even in football. They want to recruit guys that are well rounded. They touch yeah. a few different things because their bodies can just they can adapt to different things. Absolutely. So I mean, how what kind of athlete were you? Like what sports did you play? So I was big into weightlifting, and that was because my brothers got me into that. Well, all football players are into weightlifting. Yeah, you know, like I was competing, um, and then also. What kind of events? You said you football, competing. wrestling. Sorry, football, wrestling, weightlifting, and rugby. That just sum it all up. That's boom. That's okay. Pretty much it. And then if you want to go way back, I was even racing BMX bikes, stuff like that. Oh, okay. But, but when you ask about the weightlifting, <clears throat> high schools would put together weightlifting competitions. Yeah. And I had a blast doing it. And you won one, didn't you? I think yeah. you said that in the book. You in won book, something, right? I, I set a power clean state record. And I won first in that tournament. Oh, wow. So. What'd you get in the power clean? I love, that's look, my look. favorite lift, man. But if you, you got, if you did that, that's like, you know. It's, it's, I've been around CrossFit a lot since. And, and I realized that my power clean isn't as good as I thought. It, I thought it was untouchable. But, yeah. You know, weightlifting's evolving. But I, at 190 pounds, I got 285 pounds. Damn. And that was a 16-year-old kid. Damn, that's so. no joke. That's no joke. <laughs> I, I think I, mean, I could get like 250 now. Because you got you got to pop and squat. Yeah, I don't think I could do more than 250 now. I, yeah. I'm not training it. I, I, that was the only record that I felt like I was in the ballpark of. There's no way I could have got a bench record. There's okay. no way I could have got a squat record. I was strong, but like the squat and bench records were just ridiculous. And uh, mm-hmm. But I looked at the power clean and I was like, I could do that. Okay. So. In your power clean, were you explosive or were you just, just strong? Because, you know, was, you got to explode up for the power clean, I, I squat think, down. I think I was flexible. I think I was training the flexibility when nobody else was. And, you okay. Know, this is Utah high school football players back in 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of other guys were just trying to grunt it through. And yeah. I was coming off a wrestling season where I'd been doing uh, 
double leg takedown shots where I was getting down into deep lunges all the time. I think I was flexible and not when not a lot of other guys were. Okay, because so. that's kind of how I am. I just power through it. But I know that the people who have like on point technique, yeah. you can get up to the three hundreds. Like, yeah. like I've easily. since gotten into CrossFit and stuff, uh, where all of a sudden three hundred is not all that uncommon. You know, a lot of guys nowadays are hitting. I mean, not that three hundred was uncommon when I did it, but like I'm just saying teenagers kind of new movement and i was able to capitalize and go get that record for myself okay so all right in your book you talk about a lot about um not just the different types of martial arts that you got into but like your curiosity around around yeah. fighting what is the best martial arts Because i guess it's a question you have for yourself since you were like a young child yeah and your brother's kind of I want to say they inspired you to get into wrestling because they right. were wrestling as well. Absolutely. And um, yeah, how did can you tell me a little bit about that? And then also like the impact WWF or whatever that had on yeah. you. You know, I love WWF. That's why that was like the and, thing for a and, long and time. I'm glad you're calling it WWF. It's taken, <laughs> I, I still don't feel comfortable calling it WWF. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, so here I am just as kids. We're, we're playing karate in the backyard. I mean, we really call it that. It's like, hey, you want to go play some karate? You know, we're out there punching, kicking, experimenting, and we're doing all the flippy uh, turnaround spin stuff that we're seeing on movies and Ninja Turtles, stuff like that. And, and it was fun. You know, we'd beat each other up, so one of us would eventually start crying, and, and we'd take a break and then get back to it. So I've, I've always been fascinated with martial arts, but it, I always look at it like a super human power, right? If, no one, if nobody else knows martial arts and you do, like, you're awesome. You're set. Yeah. You, you watch these movies, the Ninja Turtles are being of the bad guys in uh, whatever cartoon it was you were watching growing up. But like, yeah. there's always seems to be like a fighting power. The Marvel characters always have like some sort of fighting superpower that makes them special. You see what I mean? Yeah. So in my mind, it's like, man, if a guy could fight, I mean, he'd be set. Uh -huh. Now that I'm older, I'm realizing money's way cooler than fighting. But <laughs> yeah. with that being said, as a kid, you're just like, I want the ability to beat anybody up. Yeah. And so like that fascination really never went away. Okay. So. Why did you name the book Fighting to Find God? Cuz that's a kick-ass <laughs> that's a kick-ass title. And I, yeah. you know, anybody read that they want to get the book. So why did you name it that? Right. That's a great question. That wasn't on the question you sent me. Yeah. Um so I didn't think about it. And it's honestly, all good. Take your time, man. And honestly, I I'm, I'm trying to remember the story of how I came up with that name. Fighting to Find God. I think I'm kind of at a loss of words. Well, we can come if back to it. We keep talking about it. Maybe it'll hit me. But like, I don't know that there was a special moment where I was like, this is what inspired me. To the reason I asked that, I don't know if you noticed the books I have next to me. A lot of those books are like self-improvement books. Uh -huh. And um, one of the first things that you asked me when um, I first came to your gym, you asked me like, what is God to me? What is right. my relationship with God? And I haven't had anybody ask me that question. Yeah. I rarely meet people who want to speak about God in right. general, you yeah. know? And um, I didn't grow up the most religious person. Mm -hmm. And um, when I started to believe in God, it really just it happened. I wasn't seeking it. I was um, I was in self development. I was in self improvement books. I was working on myself. And a lot of those um, books they have to do with uh, your consciousness. And basically, if you're not conscious of your thoughts, if you're thinking in a negative way, you're going to start acting in a negative way. You're going to get negative outcomes. And um, a lot of times in order to grow in life, you have to go through things to you have to go through things, to actually become the best version of yourself. Right. So that's why I thought your title was unique, because not mm -hmm. only to grow spiritually as a person, right. you have to go through something to actually to um, grow, I mean, excel to that level. Same yes. thing with fighting. I learned for me, I've always been pretty athletic. I'm quick. I'm strong. And even playing a sport like football, you can you can still dominate the game and be hurt. Mm -hmm. But with fighting. You go into that ring with any kind of injury or if you got a cold, you're going to get your ass kicked and yeah. you get humbled. And I think the best fighters, they stick in there and they keep growing through that. Absolutely. So that's why I was wondering, like, um, what kind of what kind of trials did you experience in fighting and how did that actually help you get a strong relationship with God? Right. Well, you know, we, we talked about we might go back to that question on how I got the title. As you were talking, it kind of reminded me that in my book I mentioned that. Uh, the definition of fighting, and I might get it wrong off the top of my head, but Webster Dictionary, something to do with like to struggle or surmount mm -hmm. um, is, is fighting. Um, and to, if we switch that around and it's like 
the struggle to find God. You see what I'm saying? And, mm-hmm. and that wasn't even intentional. Um, it's just as you were talking, it just kind of started hitting me. And it's like, mm-hmm. that's actually kind of a unique thing to think like, yeah, the struggle to find God. How are we going to overcome and surmount and find yeah. God otherwise? So anyway, but yeah, thanks for getting me back on that <laughs> yeah. question. Now ask that other question again. Real quick. I was wondering um, for you as you're um, in fighting, mm-hmm. like what, have you had any kind of like experiences in the ring trials that have act- actually impacted your character and made you grow spiritually and also grow as a better fighter? Yeah. I mean, the, the fighting is so chaotic that like, there's not really a lot of aha moments mm-hmm. in the, in the actual fight. Yeah. All, to me, all the lessons are learned afterwards yeah. where you're watching the video you're thinking about how you prepared yourself. You're thinking about like everything that went into it. And, and all of a sudden we're, we're starting to critique things back and forth. Mm. But kind of the big aha moment was when I was basically putting all this time and energy and effort into fighting and fighting's cool. It's fun. You mm-hmm. can make money doing it. It's really awesome. But I was putting all this time and energy into fighting and I was getting results improving seeing myself get better winning and and all of a sudden it's like well what am i doing to find god Mm -hmm. like like is that on the back burner right now because all my attention is on fighting right right yeah and so i mean who wants to put god on the back burner and and I've, i've said this to a lot of people everybody has a god whether you believe in god or not everybody has a god what do you mean by that you worship something yeah everybody worships something and so i had to ask myself am i worshiping fighting is the training the all the little competitions the jujitsu and the boxing is is my obsession with this combat sport and combat sports more important to me than building a relationship with god and and at that point, I was like, okay, maybe I need to re- recalibrate, readjust. So I, all my attention is where it should be. Now, we, we, all have, we all have hobbies. We all have things that we want to do, achieve, accomplish. And that's totally fine. But what, I'm, what I'm, I guess I'm kind of getting at and where I kind of started to see this parallel between fighting and learning more about God and understanding God was in the concept of like, am I getting lost in fighting and not really figuring out more, I guess, satisfying things about God, my relationship with God, who is God, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Um, When I was playing football, all my attention was on sports or getting stronger. Yeah. And I did that throughout my teens and my early Mm twenties. And um, I told myself that I was going to be a better uh, father better parent than my um than my father was right. but i was like what exactly does that mean yeah how do i know how do i know that you know i can say that but how do i know that's actually going to happen mm-hmm. so then that's when i started um reading some books on like um just relationships in general but i think when i read those books yeah like i said with sports i was improving physically but then with those books it made me improve it made me more conscious of like my character development my Absolutely. spiritual development and one of those things one of the things in your book that you mentioned um you mentioned you talk about Tim, mm-hmm. Tim, the boxing coach. Yeah. How he's your corner man. He's been there for the hard times for you in your fights and there's moments in the fight where he, you didn't feel like you could fight back. And then yeah. Tim, you can always recognize his voice in the crowd. And, you know, right. I've, I've been there and you can you, you can recognize that voice and then you just you don't think you just act. Right. You know, and um, you, you, you focus the whole purpose of that section was you focus on having a strong corner man. Yeah. And I think that just like in fighting, you have a strong you need a strong corner man. You also need strong relationships, strong friends in life. You need Absolutely. strong people in your corner that want to see you win. Mm-hmm. How have you dealt with that? Um, when you when you have like these trials in the ring or in life in general, how has having good people in your corner helped you excel? Yeah, and, and I use this phrase in my book: "Birds of a feather flock together." You know? Yeah. And so basically, if you find yourself surrounded by people who are just dragging you down, then you got to ask yourself, well, what kind of person are you? That you seem to attract and and constantly see yourself around those types of people, 
Uh, and I'm not saying you can't hang around bad people, but you need to be the, if you are around people who are struggling, are you the guy that's lifting them up? Or are you the guy that's taking advantage of them and tearing them down? And so uh, with that being said, I, I'm, I'm big on this, like, surround yourself with good people. Mm. But when you're around people who maybe don't have their act together, what can you do to help them out? Yeah. And that's, that's so it's kind of a, a double-edged sword where, um, where basically you, you, you want to surround yourself by good people because you want to be inspired, but don't let someone else drag you down and, 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 and be victim to, to somebody in their character. So I get what you're saying. Yeah. And that's a hard, that's a fine line. That's a hard balancing act to figure out. It is. That's a life journey because mm-hmm. it's not just a matter of surrounding yourself around the right people. Sometimes you have a connection with certain people who yeah. aren't good for you, and it's hard to break that connection. Right. You know. So I, I get that. That's always going to be a life battle. Um, you mentioned in your book that you won a state champion a championship in wrestling. Mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about like what kind of wrestler you were, and then also you said you had you got hurt, like you were trying to be. You won state championship, and you're trying to get a scholarship for. Um, for wrestling but then you got hurt like you talk about like what you were going through mentally during that time of your life because yeah, you're yeah yeah that was tough that, yeah. that was really hard and and really what it boiled down to is in utah i mean i don't want to brag or nothing but i'm i'm really good at bragging i'll brag all the time yeah go ahead <laughs> go ahead man. but in utah i was just kind of crushing the competition i mean the only two losses i had were were dqs i didn't lose i lost it was a dq but like i was owning the guys you know what i mean yeah and then i just I got one guy, I slammed him improperly. Uh, I was running the score on him. And uh, I, with a illegal slam, I got DQ'd. The other guy, I was, I was beating him in points. I looked up at the clock. I There was 10 seconds left. I was like, I don't have to do anything. There's 10 seconds. Mm. I got called for stra- uh, stalling. And I didn't realize at the time, the first stalling call, call is a warning. The second stalling is a point against you. And so he did it with like two seconds left. He gave it, he put a point against me and I was like, whatever, I still got this guy beat. I yeah. just go back out there and, uh, you know, just dance for a second or two. Well, the ref blew his whistle the third time. And, uh, I looked up at the scoreboard and I just assumed I won. There was 0. 0.02 seconds on the clock. And I was like, so easy win for me. The, the clock guy just didn't let the time run out brings us to the center and raises the other guy's hand. And uh, my coach had a mental breakdown. But the fact of the matter was... Because of that fight? (laughs) That's that decision? I got got DQ'd with point zero. I still, in my mind, I can still see it. Zero, zero, point zero, two seconds left. Yeah. And they bring me in the whole match. And I was up by like three or four points. And uh, they bring me to the center and they raise the other guy's hand. I literally wasn't looking. I wasn't saying anything in frustration. I said, no, no, I was the one that won. He says, no, no, you got disqualified. And mm-hmm. I was like, what? But with that being said, uh, we did, you asked me about wrestling. I was pretty darn good. I ended up uh, in the state. That was not the state finals. In the state finals match, I pinned my guy comfortably in the second round. I didn't really struggle. It yeah, was easy okay. For me. When I, it was like, okay, this is game time. And then I just handled business going into the state tournament. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. You said you did um, still fists. Well, no, you didn't say that, but I did some research on you. You right. won a Steel Fist Championship? Steel Fist title, yeah. What is that? Like, is that not bare knuckle? Go ahead. No, no, that's, that's uh, just MMA. Okay. Steel Fist is probably the biggest promotion here in Utah. Okay. Um, and there's some debate in that, but, like, they do the most shows, and they have the, they're have the most active MMA show here in Utah. Okay. And so you could kind of compare it to a, a Utah championship. All right. So... Okay, and you also hold a boxing title, right? Aren't you yeah. a championship right now? Champion right now? Uh, and when I wrote the book, I was I was only three and zero in boxing. Yeah. And since I'm now eight and zero, and I just won a couple months back. ABF Western United States Heavyweight Title, and that's a okay. Title. Yeah. When is your next fight for a uh, boxing? I know you had a you were training for an MMA fight, but dude. Yeah. flaked on you he didn't show up or yeah, he canceled but, the fight but josh berkman and this kind of all goes comes full circle since we've been talking about some of my high school days josh berkman who has a bunch of ufc fights he was in the ultimate fighter um he and i went to the same high school okay and uh 
he went and did his MMA career. He was a he didn't go on a mission or anything. So he just went out of high school, played some college ball, and and now then he found himself in the UFC. He did really well, and, and he's forty now. I'm thirty eight, and uh, found out that I was fighting, and and called me out in the last show. So when my opponent didn't show up. He says, too bad we don't have an opponent for Eric, but I'll go down there and call Eric out in this fight in the next show. So Josh and I are fighting in January um, for Fierce Fighting. Oh, wow. He has his own gym as well, right? He's, I think he's just opening his own gym right now. Okay, I just found out about him. I started doing um, like hot yoga. Uh-huh. I started doing that just so I can get my hips because I actually do um, Shadokan Karate. So we have... Right. Uh, I got something tomorrow. I'll compete tomorrow for that. And we have to do our okay. katas and then we have to do our little sparring and whatnot. I've been going to your gym. I haven't been, well, I haven't been there for a while because right. um, I know I'm going to be boxing for the most part and be a heavyweight and some big dudes, but I just got off an injury. So I'm trying to get my feet back. Right. And I don't know. Do you know anything about karate? I've, I've dabbled with it a little bit, but. Well, a lot of the karate competitions, every, we're going to get into this, but every martial arts bring something to the table yeah. but nothing's perfect obviously you know what the kind of boxing you don't use your feet you don't grab but with karate is mostly um you have to keep your feet moving the entire time like right. you have to keep jumping back and it's all about like angles and straight attacks and then back out that's all it is about and they they don't let you just brawl yeah. like in uh, box and whatnot so for me it's good for my footwork is getting my feet back where it was at mm -hmm. um but anyways yeah um one of the things that i wanted to talk about you mentioned in your book that you had like an itch to read the uh, Book of Mormon. Right. Where does that come from? I mean, I've never read any religious book from beginning <laughs> to end. I think you've read it a few times. The honest truth, I've never really stopped reading it. Okay. I, I don't know how many times I've probably read it. I have no idea. Um, but it first came when I was in, in Utah. We have what's called seminary where in junior high and high school, there's a religious class you can take. Mm -hmm. And it's usually funded and kind of put on by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so it, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but you'll notice next to these high schools, there's always a small little separate building um, on like a different piece of property. So you kind of walk out of the school and you go to the seminary. Um, and I think that's something to do with you can't talk about religion in school. So the church puts out a class you can take off school property. So I was in one of these seminary classes and they just said, hey, before the year is over, I want you, everybody in this class to read the Book of Mormon. And mm -hmm. so I was like, I'll okay, give it a shot. Yeah. Um, I also mentioned in the book how I grew up always in the special ed class, the resource, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I, was, yeah. I was a kid when class got going, they would take me and the other slow kids and put us in another class. Oh, <laughs> so wow. That just kind of emphasizes a little bit like when i was asked to read a, a book that has 531 pages in it um as a 14 year old kid i was like a try i don't know that i could I, I honestly think that i'd only read a couple books in my entire life and we're talking small kid books and then to tackle yeah, a yeah. big religious book of 500 yeah. pages i was like ah well what the heck well i mean what's it gonna hurt if i mm -hmm. if i don't who cares if I do great, if I don't understand it, whatever I can at least checklist. I did it. Yeah. And so I just got after it, started going about a chapter or more per day. And mm. like nine months later, I think I finally had it done. Yeah. So you said you made a deal with yourself in the book that if you didn't get a football scholarship <laughs> or if you didn't get a wrestling scholarship, yeah. you were going to go on your mission. Yeah. Did your mission do anything for you? I mean, does it did it change your character at all? Like, absolutely. Okay. Like, at the time, sure. What, what did I really want out of life? I wanted a football scholarship probably first because MMA wasn't really a thing, so I didn't know if if there would be, ever be any money in in wrestling. So if mm. someone would ask me, "Do you want to go to college for football or wrestling?" I'd be like, "Football." Um, I didn't like football more, and I was better at wrestling, but. Uh, I just didn't see any future in wrestling. So with that being said, I thought, but if I have to fall back on a wrestling scholarship, then I'll take a wrestling scholarship. And I was good enough at wrestling that a lot of teams were offering me offers, but I also was bad enough at school that I knew that it had, I taken an offer, I would have just went to school and failed all my classes. Okay. And so 
with, with that on the table, I was like, and they weren't scholarships. They're just like, hey, we got a spot for you on the team. Like you'd you'd be great on our team. Just just come over and we'll get you some free books or something. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I'll I'll get over there and I'll throw all my classes that kicked me out of school. So I was like, all right. The deal was if I didn't get a decent scholarship, then I got to go. Yeah. Go on a mission. And then I was like, but I don't know if I should. I, I don't know if I really believe or know. So let me read the Book of Mormon one more time. So I started uh, reading the Book of Mormon one more time. And I got to about Second Nephi, and the scripture hit me, and I was like, "That's my answer." I, I, not only do I need to go, I want to go now. Mm-hmm. I got from that point forward, I got very excited about it, and I haven't really mm-hmm. lost the drive or the passion since. I mean, we, we all have our spiritual uphills and our spiritual downhills. Yeah, but I've been pretty much very passionate about God, religion, my church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Kind of ever since that moment. Okay. That was a big defining moment for me. And where'd you go on your mission? Washington, D.C. South Mission, which is basically Northern Virginia. Okay, and how was that? Like, you know, I hear stories from people that I know, Mormons that I know that went on their mission, they're dealing with people, talking about the religious books. I know there's some positives and some negatives. Like, can you talk about the experience that a, a missionary yeah. usually has? So, it's <clears> really, <throat> it's a really weird deal, right? You're sent out there to talk to people about the church. To talk mm-hmm. to people about God. You're, and so for two years, I got a chance to just sit and study. Uh, they give you two-hour allotment a day to just sit and read Scripture. Um, for two years, I got in thousands upon thousands of religious conversations where it's sit down and talk to a homeless guy about God. It's sit down and talk to, in Washington, D.C., a politician. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Someone who's in some sort of government position. They sit down and talk to a, a doctor, a lawyer, highly educated people, or sit down and talk to a guy's a janitor sweeping the streets. You know what I yeah. mean? So it's like, I mean, I, I got all sorts of different perspectives and opinions. Yeah. And another really u- unique thing about that was when I first got out there, I felt like it was constantly a one-on-one battle where it was like, okay, I used to figure out how to try to beat people on the wrestling mat. Now I got to figure out how to beat people intellectually yeah because every conversation really almost always revolved around someone having their side their opinion what they believe is true me having my side my opinion what i believe is true now let's duke it out and see who can win this yeah which is completely wrong (laughs) (laughs) And and i talk about this in my book it's wrong because we are all wrong okay we are all wrong. And so the, to sit there and try to have a, a, I'm right, this is what I believe. No, I'm right, this is what I believe. This is a complete waste of time. Okay. Because we're all wrong. We are absolutely all wrong. The notion that we might think we know who God is okay, is absurd. And so, I mean, I kind of wish I could go back and do it again. Um, but man, that was a lot of work, a lot of time. Very, very strenuous. But like, on the other hand, I still to this day love the conversations that I've had with people about God and religion. And, and I, before it was almost like I'd get nervous, right? Someone would shake my hand and be like, come in, let's talk. And I'd be like, all right, game face. I got to beat this guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I got to prove that I'm right. And then with, with time, and, and we're even talking with time into my adult life since my mission, I've started to realize, like, it's not about being right anymore because I'm wrong. So it's not about being right. It's about, hey, why don't you share with me some experiences you've had? I'll share with you some experiences I've had. And let's see if we can build on these experiences. Mm. And, and it's, com- it's a completely different way of looking at it. So now I get really excited about talking to people about God. That's why when you came in and mentioned, like, I, I had asked you these questions and I, it, it kind of yeah. was excited to talk to you about God. That's because I am genuine, genuinely very excited to talk about God with people because I'm not trying to win anymore. Okay. I'm just trying to like. Trying to what, grow. What do you know? Mm-hmm. You know something I don't know? Well, let me share with you some things that I know, but what do you know? Yeah. Because you know, we neither one of us really know. Yeah. So. That's wise. <laughs> that is wise, man. I got lost in the sauce for a second. <laughs> what yeah. is, uh, are you still involved with the church to this day? Like, you know. Yeah, do, absolutely. Okay. I teach. 
the primary program, uh, eight, nine year old kids. Okay. Yeah. And fighting, you mentioned like learning from your losses mm-hmm. and, um, I mean, you hear that as a kid a lot, but when I've been competing, I've learned that, I mean, it is really true. You'll, you'll get some people who are just dominating in this, any kind of like fighting. And then yeah. I've seen it, I've seen a professional boxing as well. Like you'll get somebody that's undefeated, it's killing it. They're used to getting all the shine and then they take a loss, but then they never learn from that loss. They get worse. It's like they go through a depression or whatnot. Yeah, like, um, why do you think some fighters actually get better when they, um, they get some kind of resistance or they get a loss. And then there's other fighters who just, they don't show up anymore. You mentioned that as well, like sparring. People don't show up or anything. They just don't, they don't come anymore. Like, why do you think that happens? And and I mentioned this, it's like, hey, your ego and your ability to fight are absolutely attached to each other. Like you're either a good fighter and, and your ego's all built up because you're a good fighter or you're a bad fighter. And you now you're depressed and you don't have any like you seem to have lost hope, you know. And so mm-hmm. a lot of people, I think, assume be for no good reason, but just that they just assume like, hey, I could fight if I had to fight. I would do great. Yeah. And then they get into it and maybe it's not fighting, but it's wrestling or boxing or kickboxing, martial arts of some kind. And then they, they're not winning. Yeah. Well. In a combat sport, if you're not winning, like, you're probably not that good of a fighter. I mean, in comparison to other people who are training on the streets, it's a whole new, whole new equation, whatever. Yeah. But, like, if you can't seem to put wins together, then maybe this isn't your thing. Or people, I mean, people, it sounds bad, but people are delusional. And then the older I get, the more I learn that people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I hate to say this, but I'm the concluding reason, the same thing, man. Everybody <laughs> gets to like, oh my god. And they're probably looking at me saying, "Eric, you're the most delusional one out of all of us." But yeah. the the reason I say this is a lot of us, though we haven't really been put up against it, think that we're really quite something. Yeah, you know, and, and, but but we're not. And especially first world, they're like, we're here for, with first world problems. We're trying to figure out what gender we should call ourselves. Um, well, in the third world, they don't know if they're going to eat that day or not. Yeah. I mean, they, they're worried about a storm coming in because they they don't have a roof over their head. Like those mm. are real problems. Yeah. Um, th- those are people who are really up against it. We're not up against it. We, this is, we, we live an easy life here in America. I mean, even poor people have it nice. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the fact is, I don't know. I kind of lost my train of thought there, but yeah, we, we got it easy here and, and we, we don't really have real problems. I see what you're so. saying. I see what you're saying. So it's basically because it's so easy when we encounter some kind of like problem, some people just spaz out. That's right. That's, that's what I was getting at. Yeah. They people, can't handle it. People, you know, they got a nice nine to five. They have a nice comfortable living and they, they, they get bored with where they're at in life. And they're like, Hey, you know what? I could create some excitement by maybe start fighting or I could mm-hmm. do this. I could do that. And all of a sudden, they got this problem where they're not as good as they thought they were going to be. Yeah. And why? I mean, you got a house over your head. You got a couple cars in the garage. You got food in your refrigerator. Why would you want to fight if you don't have to? That's not doing anything for you. Yeah. So why do it? Yeah. So why do you fight? Um. You, you know, for me, it's it's a living now. It's with the gym, um, teaching the lifestyle of it it's it's a way of life for me now it's a living and a lot of people think or have said like well so do you do it for the money and it's like i mean kind of maybe right now in my life i'm i'm still training and competing for money but for years when i was younger i never got paid a dime and and i kept coming back and doing it especially when i was in the early 90s wrestling no one told me that when you grow, if you're a good wrestler, you could grow up and make money doing this. So mm-hmm. there's no money to be made in this. Yeah. It's just yeah. some sort of primal, like, I think we're all born with it, honestly. Yeah. We want to be the alpha male. And it's like mm. direct path, bada bing, bada boom. You beat somebody up, you start climbing that totem pole of where you're at on alpha status. Yeah. So Never thought of it like that. I know for me, I've always been physical. Just with football, you know, even I, I hated basketball because basketball, people can cheat. 
They can elbow you. <laughs> you can't do anything back. But you right. get like cheap shot, cheap shots all the time in uh, basketball, football. Absolutely. You could hit somebody. Yeah. So I love football, and I noticed that when I got out of football, and I tried to be live the everyday regular person type of life. Not only was it just like, not only did I not have that physical outlet, I, I was around different type of men. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. when you're around, when you're in sports, you're all you're around like aggressive guys, like all the time. The mindset, the thinking is just different. The way they carry themselves and the level of respect they have for the man next to them right. is different. But when you're around like, like you said, people who are comfortable, you know, it's it's a whole nother experience. And uh, for me, the reason I got into martial arts, I think in life as a man, maybe it is primal, but it, I always need some kind of challenge. I yeah. need something that like challenges my spirit, challenges me physically. Cause then right. there was a um, psychologist, I don't know his name, but he was talking about aging and he was saying that um, doing martial arts or any kind of fighting, it actually slows down the aging process. And it's because yeah. your mind has to think faster. Like if there's like punches yeah, coming yeah. at you, you have to like Complex you, you, you keep that. So it keeps you younger. So it only the only like con to it is that you're getting hit in the head. So if you don't get <laughs> yeah. hit, if you don't get hit and you're dodging, it's kind of like an anti aging, yeah. you know, type of thing. Well, and that brings me back to or brings up jujitsu because you're not getting hit in the head and submission okay. type grappling. And I yeah. would say jujitsu is the martial art to bring home to your mom and say, I'm going to marry this martial art mm. because I'm not going to get hit in the head. It's going to keep me fit. It's going to keep me strong and uh, flexible. Like jujitsu is awesome. Yeah. So that's always kind of been one of my favorites, even though maybe I've done a little bit better per se in boxing and MMA and wrestling yeah. and stuff like that. But jujitsu has, has been awesome. So I haven't taken it serious. I went to a few of your classes uh-huh. and um, I'm usually there just for the, like the box. I like to right. do those classes, but if I stick, stay with, for MMA, I'm usually there just to like get beat up. I know people there are better than me. It doesn't matter who, how the person looks. I know that person knows more than me. I can overpower <laughs> them to a level the extent, right. but eventually somebody's going to submit me. Yeah. You know, I, I remember you like grabbed me and put your head into my neck. <laughs> I could not believe it. I thought I told a few people, but I was like, man, I was like, I was like uh, sparring with somebody. And I was like, he just put his head in my throat and like <laughs> grabbed me. <laughs> I was like... It's fun though. I yeah. enjoyed it. Like I said, I'm not in there. I'm not. I don't go to jujitsu to win. I just go to have a good time. I was Absolutely, just like, yeah. and I know people there are actually competing. So it's just another body, so that they can actually, you know, learn something. Right. What do you think makes, from your experience, you've been around fighters for a long time. Yeah. You've been around guys that you thought were just amazing, but they turned out to not be as good as you thought they were going to be. Absolutely. And some guys. You know, you look at him, you think, oh, this guy, he, he's not shit. And then all of a sudden, he's like, whoa, he really, he shows up. Yeah, you're talking about Russell. Yeah. Just going, but yeah, <laughs> <guys> too. <laughs> How do you, what makes a person a good fighter? Honestly, like we, we all have our genetic gifts, right? Like how fast are we? How strong are we? So we got genetic gifts and some more than others. We also have uh, hand-eye coordination. We also have like mental stability. Uh, how fast can we think on our toes, on our feet? So there's a lot that plays into this. But what trumps all these possible, I guess you could say, given gifts that we have, what trumps all of them is time and consistency and the amount of effort that goes in. And so you can take a guy that has zero gifts, zero talent, but he's been around it for a couple of years now. Uh, he shows up two, three hours a day. And all of a sudden, people who are far superior as far as athletic gifts are concerned can't really hang with them anymore. Mm-hmm. You know? And so, uh, and, and people always come to the gym thinking that they can, you know, ha- have a fight in the next couple months. And, and I think that's crazy because I would not walk into a, um, take a piano lesson and say, hey, I'd like to, to book a show in like three or four months. If you could just get me to where I could be in a piano show in the next yeah. six months, that'd be awesome. Story but of my life. <laughs> I'll talk about that after you finish, but I've yeah, been but, in that guy. But, but basically, everybody would look at you and be like, you want to you wanna be in a, what is it called, a piano recital? Is that where they go out and perform in front of people? I don't know anything about music. Yeah, yeah. But you want to be a, a pianist? in six months you're out of your mind yeah yet people come into the gym and think like well i mean 
I could be fighting in the next, like, when's the next show? And it's like, matter of fact, I've even had people come to me and they've already booked the fight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a free country. They call up a promoter and say, I want to fight. They come to me and they're like, I got a fight. And it's like, you already have one? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Are you out of your mind? Yeah. Like, would you go play in a band and never practice guitar before? Yeah. Like, it's crazy talk. Every time I've gotten my ass kicked, <laughs> it was because of that. I remember when I yeah. first started with the former brothers, and I fought one of your guys. Yeah, when I was with the, when I was with the former brothers, I had a guy that um, I was, we were both beginners. I sparred with consistently, mm-hmm. and then um, I won my first fight. But then um, he stopped showing up. I had nobody to spar against anymore, and it was kind of like I wasn't getting that. I wasn't getting. I wasn't getting that like consistent work. You know, so when I got, but because I had an athletic background, I had talent, I thought I would just yeah. go in there and win. But it's it's a whole nother ball game, like right. the mental work and then like the footwork and knowing when to respond. And you think it comes automatically, like right. your mind, your body doesn't do what your mind think it, it should be doing, but it's either sharp or it's not. Yeah. Exa- exactly. And I've been in those, I've been in those situations, but that's the way I see it is, is that it's how you get humbled and that's how you learn. Right. That's that's how you become a, a better fighter. Absolutely, you know, yeah. is when you you go through those like you know those life. If I remember changes. right, you fought Mike Smith, the guy that I was training. Yeah, and then I I feel like I I, I remember this conversation. I grabbed you afterwards and I said, "Hey, how often were you sparring?" And you're like, ah, and you kind of said that. You're like, "Oh, I don't really have a good sparring yeah. partner right now." I said, "Honestly, I'll tell you what the difference was." Mike has two or three hundred sparring rounds within the last couple months because mm. we had my the, that gym we were tracking how many okay. rounds guys were sparring. Yeah, and so, um, and you're absolutely like Mike for the people who are listening. Mike was, um, probably he's a big, tough, strong kid, but not the most athletically gifted. If you guys yeah. were being some sort of weightlifting or combine together, you would have blown him out of the water. Yeah, like, there's no doubt about it. But his timing, his footwork, his training, it was just mm-hmm. all kind of there. And it sounds like now I'm hearing the other side of the story now where it's like you, you had lost your training partner. Mm-hmm. You'd lost kind of your rhythm, your routine. Yeah. And so. He just didn't stop either. I remember I hit him really good with like a jab or two. And he like stopped for a second. <laughs> and then he like, but then he just kept coming. And it was like yeah. that the rest of the fight. He just kept, he kept his combinations. Yeah. He kept his rhythm the mm-hmm. whole fight. And it got to a point where I was just like, avoiding the whole <laughs> the whole fight so i was just like yeah. i just got exhausted i was like man and then right. even when i tried to throw a punch i was exhausted it was too yeah. much energy to throw the punch Absolutely. you know but you have to drill that in you have to like yep. train your body how to um throw those blows when some throw those blows right you said you did um or well, maybe oh yeah at the end of your book and i did a little bit of research you did the contender right uh tough or the ultimate fighter the ultimate fighter yep how was that? Can you talk about your experience, like going into it, the training, and then how that was, was that crazy. the end of it? That was crazy. So I don't say this much. I don't want to blame losses on excuses, but like I got excuses for days if you need them. Um, but I, I made the Ultimate Fighter season seventeen. That was Chell Sonnen and John Jones, um, and it was the first fight. After the first fight, they'll let you. Then Chell Sonnen or John Jones would be picking who's on what team. Um, well, when I finally got, it was official. I got the phone call. They called me back. I've been training here in Utah now. And they're like, you've made it. Here's the day you're going to report. It was about a month and a half out, I think. And uh, and I'm like, sweet. So I go to the gym early that next morning, and I'm training hard. I think I'd put in a nine or ten hour day of training that day. And uh, I'm leaving the gym. And one of my teammates shows up. And he's like, hey, I did everything I could to get off work early. Could we train a bit before you go home? Like, I kind of got here just to train with you. So I go, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I put my gym bag down, wrap my hands back up, and we get in there. And as we're as he and I are, are we're kind of sparring. It was light sparring, though. But I turned left. I should have turned right. And bada bing, bada boom. I had separated one of my ribs. So that is basically you got the cartilage, which your sternum goes down the center. You got your ribs coming out the side, and and they had just separated. I bet you couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe. Couldn't yeah. move. Um, big pop, big, pop, 
and it's like, oh, what was that? Yeah. And, and I'm trying to suck wind. Big breath of air. It pops again. It pops into place. I stand yeah. up. It pops back out of place. Um, that was painful. And that was about a, a month and a half, give or take, before the Ultimate Fighter. And so my coach, who was, and this was Mike Stedham, I mentioned him earlier, he was wise. He basically said, just call him up and say you can't do it. I was like, dude, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like, mm-hmm. UFC. Um, so I was like, no, I'm not making that phone call. Yeah. We're, fi- we're fighting. I've, I've been there it. before, too. <laughs> I've been there before, too, and it, it wasn't the best move. <laughs> yeah. okay, we're fighting. Um, and at the time, I think I was on a five fight win streak, and I had knocked most of my guys out within a minute. And so I was like, dude, I got. You can power. handle it. I got yeah. power in these hands. We, with a broken rib, all I got to do is connect once or twice. Those guys are going to sleep. I win, you know, right off in the sunset. Yeah. And so basically I continued to train, but every day I came in, once again, that pop, pop in place, pop out of place. And uh, Mike said of my trainer was like, dude, you're like a crackhead. Like you, you got to, and, and training is your fix. Like you got to mm. stop training. You got to give this thing time to heal. So I actually ended up setting up a tent up on the side of the Utah Lake, and I just sat there in a lawn chair and uh, fished all day. Me and my dog. Okay. <laughs> just to just to just to see if I could sit there all day and do nothing. No surgery. No. Have you had surgery to this day on that? No, but it, it, they heal up. Okay. Like, well, it, okay. It's it's kind of a pretty common injury. Okay. Um, but they eventually find a spot and, and you'll just, see. It, if I get pretty lean, you can see my chest is kind of lumpy where I've had it. This actually happened a couple of times, but where it's lumpy, where the bone and the cartilage kind of mend back together. So here I am on the side of Utah Lake trying to let this thing heal. Um, and I'd stand up and it would pop. I'd sit down and pop again. And then here comes the day to go out to Vegas to the Ultimate Fighter. And I remember that morning I wake up and I'm like, I got to fight today. I sit up out of bed and my rib just goes, and I was like, oh, man. Yeah. So whatever, we're going to go fight this guy. Yeah. And, uh, I go out there and, and I'm feeling good, man. I, it was Frank Mir who was, uh, helping me warm up, kicking pads and, and I could kick, I could do different things as long as I was kind of standing straight up. Yeah. And I, cause I still had some pop. I still had some power. And, uh, I was like, do you know what? I, I don't care. I'm, I'm still gonna, I'm still gonna do great. Well, I'm still gonna get this guy. And I go out there. He just bull rushes me, slams me into the cage. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> at that point, it was just emergency mode. I went for all these like last minute desperate uh, submission attempts. One was called like a go go flotta or something. And I just didn't have the oomph to to get up and finish it. Yeah. And meanwhile, he just kind of bull rushes over me. Elbows me in the head in the head a bunch of times, and then that's that. The fight was over. Okay. And he actually passed me out. Just funny story since we're on the topic. Herb Dean was the one who was the ref, and I had blacked out. But in blacking out, I was still throwing punches. Uh-huh. Herb Dean pulls the guy off me, and the, the I think it was Dana White, and I don't remember who else it was probably Forrest Griffin or something was sitting at the table, and they're like, "Why did Herb Dean stop the fight? He's still punching." But then when my opponent is completely all the way off me, I'm laying there by myself, just throwing punches. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't see that. <laughs> so Damn, um, man. With that being said. Why did uh, that happen? What was that all about? It was uh, uh, season 17 of The Ultimate Fighter. Okay. It was the first fight of that season. It wasn't the very first fight, I, but it was the first kind of round. Like of episode of thing? Yeah, first okay. episode. Okay. Okay. So with that being said, uh, Herb Dean saved my life. Thank you, Herb Dean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no saying how long I might have been there getting just blacked out. That's intense, man. Wild punches. That's intense. So. I've been a. Hey, I've been there too. When you're in the fight game, that's yeah. That's what happens. Honestly, yeah. it happens to everybody. It happens to Tyson. <laughs> it's yeah. happening to him. It happened. It's gonna happen to somebody else. Um, what was I about to ask? Bellator. Yeah. How long did you do that? That no excuses. I, I got in for one fight and I lost. Okay. Like I say, like I'd love to sit and tell everybody, well, well the losses I have, I lost because of this, I lost because of that. Nope. Uh, Jose, Jose Jose Rodriguez beat me fair and square. Okay. Like, nothing. He, yeah, I just got beat. Okay. So, and then yeah. 
I didn't have any long term contract with him or anything. Okay. All right. Cool. From what is your um, what is your favorite martial arts? Because you you do mix martial arts, but yeah. you as a fighter, you always have your go tos and whatnot. What is your yeah. favorite, and what do you think is the best martial art? If there is, so any with, best. With that being said, the best martial art is the one that suits your goals. Mm-hmm. So so you you can only know what your what the best martial art is if you know what your goal is. Okay, period. and that's it. And so, if you want to be good at punching, boxing. If you want to be good at submission grappling, jujitsu. If you want to be good at taking people down and not getting taken down, wrestling. Um, so, with that being said, I always say like there's kind of three superhuman powers I think we should all want to have. And my whole life I've been passionate about the fighting superpower, right? The other superpower is a uh, kind of weaponry, like being good with guns. And the reason this is important is if you had to defend yourself, right? We're all helpless victims unless we can fight. But if our opponent has a gun, then we better also have a gun. We better be better at using that gun than them. And then the third kind of superhuman power that I think we, everyone should have and want to have is uh, legal, like lawyers, constitution, your rights. You mm-hmm. see what I'm saying? So like, if, if there's some sort of a discrepancy, something going on, some sort of contention, can you fight hand to hand? Maybe fight with weapons. I mentioned guns, but that would also be included with like yeah. whatever's in the room, whatever you get your hands on, nice, whatever. Yeah. And then when the dust settles, can you back yourself legally? And mm-hmm. so in my mind, I I, I kind of always sum up those three superpowers as like, man, everybody should be very concerned about those three things because you never know when you're going to have to fight hand to hand possibly need a weapon yeah and then settle the dust in court and hope that you were right yeah <laughs> i mean we're, we're without getting politics involved we see kyle rittenhouse in the news right now mm. um you know he had a gun he was successful with that gun he didn't die and he was able to get the people off of him but what he did was it legal should he be going to jail for this did he understand the ramifications ramifications of those actions like, yeah there's too many gray areas yeah and yeah. so like i say if you don't understand and, and have a full comprehension of those three things you could i mean anybody can go out there on a rampage and just dominate people mm. but is that going to land them in jail and yeah all of a sudden it wasn't worth it so when we talk about the best martial arts you have to have a goal in mind if you don't have a goal then doesn't matter what the best martial art is so let's see when i think about fighting i'm usually thinking about not leaving my feet and the reason i say that is because outside of a one-on-one fight Mm -hmm. a fair competition a one-on-one fair competition fight i think wrestling or if you have a good wrestling background you can't go wrong in a one-on-one because you can get somebody on the ground and and in the ufc we see all american wrestlers time and time and time and time again win the ufc championship okay so so but with i mean if that's your goal to win the ufc championship like when you're a young kid get on a wrestling team yeah so yeah so yeah that's that that supports my point but if i'm in like the street or i'm at the bar that's usually where it's going to happen somebody's going to see you at a party and they're going to feel some type of way and then you know it's going to be more than one person so for me i always thought that boxing or track you gotta have <laughs> you gotta have good wind. Right. You gotta have good feet and just get out of there. <laughs> get Absolutely. out of there, man. Or have a good group of men with you that aren't punks either, you know? And then you bring weapons into the equation and, uh, and yeah. all of a sudden it's a whole new ball game. Yeah. And and that's kinda of why I talk about those three superpowers is fighting, weaponry, legal. And yeah. and I wish I was a lawyer. There's no way I'd ever become one. Mm. But it is very interesting to watch how cases play out in court and kind of see why decisions were made certain directions. Yeah. Uh, I still don't understand all of it, man. But um, I want to talk about your book a little bit more. Yeah. Why did you write that book? What compelled you to write the book in the first place? So, like I said, I'm currently a primary teacher. At the time I started writing it, I was a Sunday school teacher. So the difference is I'm teaching kids now. But back when I was writing the book, I was teaching the adult classes in the church. Um, And I would be at the gym teaching, 
and I'd be like, it's kind of a, I'd say something in the middle of a martial arts class, and I'd be like, it's kind of a life principle right there. It kind of applies to the, the gospel as well. I'm going to go write that down. Mm-hmm. And then I'd be teaching in Sunday school, and I'd be like, that yeah, reminds me of something that I taught in fighting, you know, mm-hmm. and then vice versa, back and forth. So the fighting and the mar- the the church lessons I was preparing and the f- fighting classes I was teaching, I kept having these like little aha moments. I'd write them down, write them down, write them down. All of a sudden, I start getting quite a, quite quite a, a big bigger. stack of little to-dos, little great ideas. And I finally, I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a book. Not that I, I'm an author. I'm not an author at all. But I'm going to write a book. And even if it's just something I give to my kids on my deathbed so they can understand who their old man was a little bit better. Yeah. I was like, I probably won't try to publish or it might just all be handwritten. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got a little bit more into it, a little bit more into it, a little bit more into it. And then I finally got past this like point of no return where I was like, I've spent so much time and energy on this book. I would kind of be dumb to not finish it off and cap it off right Mm -hmm. um get it edited get it into a book format um get it published get it on amazon to where you can actually uh listen to the audio get the ebook i was like i'm just gonna go go for it it costs a lot of money took a lot of time but like i said i felt like i was to that point of no return i was like you have to finish it whatever it costs that's what i'm doing taking all my paychecks living on as little as I can and putting the rest of the money towards the book. And so when it was all in, in the total time frame, it took me to write the book and finish the book. It was about, I want to say three years, three and a half years. till I was done with say like the audio version of it as well. Mm-hmm. So. You mentioned this in your book and I've heard it in other books that I've read as well. And I'm just to be honest, I don't have a complete understanding of it, but you used to talk about love a lot. And the message that I hear all the time is God is love. Love is the way. And it's not always easy to see that. Right. So why did you incorporate love into your book? And then how is it like, how do you apply it? Well, we're going back to the conversation of like trying to find God. Because fighting to find God or struggling to find God. There's a lot of, you could talk with one guy at one religion and he would say, you need to do this if you want to find God. Talk to another guy from another religion. You need to do this to, to find God. Um, and we can all go back and forth on what our opinion is on the best way to find God. But the reason I think love is so crucial is because pretty much anyone in their in the right mind would say, well, love is kind of center, right? Like, Like if you're talking to some random person of a different faith and you're like, well, well, my church promotes love. Well, so does mine. You see what I mean? So like it's, it's the one thing that everyone kind of unanimously agrees on. Okay. Well, if everyone unanimously agrees on love, then that should be the, the, the key right there. The, the focus. Now we could also say there's a religion out there that doesn't like love and they, and they want you to be kind of a, a mean guy or rude and consider it but none of us really want to be part of that religion <laughs> and if you do that's called atheism yeah and, and if you do <laughs> that, that shows birds of a feather flock together so go yeah. be with all the people who don't want to care help love support anybody that's fine yeah uh, go hang out with those guys so w- when all these churches are and religious beliefs different denominations are saying like no no love is key love is key love is key all of a sudden, to me, that's a that's kind of a, a warning. Like, that's 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 part of the key. That mm-hmm. that stuck out in my head. Like, no one argues on that one. No one debates that point. Okay. And so, if it's a point that's not debated, maybe we should think twice about it. Mm-hmm. So, you talk a lot about charity as well. Mm-hmm. How's charity made you a better person and better fighter? Yeah, one thing I mentioned in the book is the simple fact that like, I don't like service projects. I don't like charity. And that's because I'm selfish. Right? Yeah. I mean, and, and the sooner you realize that you're a selfish person, the sooner we can kind of move on and work to not be selfish. But like, I'll be real. Like if something comes up, 
I'm not real excited. I mean, right now I've got a bunch of kids at the house, so I should be helping them out, out my wife a lot more than I do. Mm-hmm. If I'm laying down and she's like, honey, can you help me? And it's like, ugh, yeah, give me a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm dragging myself up off the sofa to go finish clean or help put a kid to bed. Um, it's hard to be full service, but whatever the service is, I never regret doing it. You know what I mean? Like I don't get up from helping my wife out and think like, I hate helping her out. You know, like I'm yeah. always like, oh, now that I helped her out, she's going to be happy with yeah. me. You know what I mean? But that goes for anything. I, I mean, and if anybody wants to prove me wrong, go help somebody, you know, go near a soup kitchen or find your nearest homeless guy, buy him a meal to eat, go help somebody. It'll be inconvenient. It won't be to your best interest. It won't be something that is helping you achieve your life goals because you're helping somebody else, not you, um, taking your time, your money. But whenever I do it, I don't regret it. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden we see that love, nobody really argues with love when it comes to fighting, finding God. And also no one's really going to argue with charity and service. So if no one argues those two points, then that should be your focus. Okay. So you mentioned, uh, man, in your book, you mentioned the seven fighting principles. Uh huh. Oh gosh. Do you, I don't remember what they are. You're putting me on the spot. (laughs) You can grab. (laughs) I think I got over there by you. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) Yeah, man. Could you talk about first, you know, state what the, the seven fighting principles are. And then um, just talk about them a little bit. I'll give you some time. The first one we got is goals. Second, access to information. An open mind. Humility. Learning from others. Testing the information personally. And not wasting time on useless traditions. Mm. So the, what's unique about that is it goes for fighting and it goes through discovering God. I mean, those are probably seven pretty good life. Just be that type of person. You know what I mean? Be humble. Learn from others. Don't waste your time. Um, so now we have these seven kind of things to, to wrap your, your life around. And are you doing it with your, your, your life? your hobbies, your goals, and are you doing it to find God? And so, first things first, you have to have a goal to find God. If you don't have a goal to find God, then, like I say, even those who want to find God never really find Him because you got to think about who God is. And this is my belief in God. He created the heavens and the earth. He created everything that you can wrap your head around. Which means you cannot wrap your head around him. You you can't. He, and if we want to go to someone who might be like, oh, I don't know if I believe in God or not. Well, that's fine, but everything exists. We know that because we're here. Mm -hmm. Was there an organizer? If there was an organizer, there's no way we can fully comprehend him. We can't. <laughs> it's funny. There's a book <laughs> called The Kabbalion that talks about God and talk and it's it calls God the all. Mm-hmm. And it says the all, what is the all? The all is the all knowing. How was the universe created? How was anything created? Well, the all could not have taken a piece of itself and created the all because the all is everything. So it's like it talks about how you conceiving something it says like a human being since we're all child children of god so we all have god-like abilities ability to think ability to create we have things that make us special make us unique but we are not gods you hear people say i am god Mm -hmm. no you're not a god you're just (laughs) a you know a a piece of you know a part of his creation absolutely you know and the all basically the, the the whole purpose of that book is that it talks about how um how your mental thinking is um how we first before we actually create with our hands it comes from the mind first and it talks about how um 
before there was before there was universe there was nothing so how was it created and it had to be there had to be some kind of mental creation that happened yeah. before that so yeah basically your your understanding of it, it kind of it correlates with some of the stuff that i've been um reading so that's pretty cool that you got right. there it's yeah fighting how to get there you know? <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah i mean if you don't have a goal and you don't care if god exists then who cares if god exists yeah and and i don't know if you're gonna get to this or not but like i've, I've always said like if you don't want a god you don't have to have one and if you want a god you can have one now, I did mention we all we we all have we worship a something. God. We worship something. So if you don't want this all powerful creator to exist, and we've got to put a few things together though here. This all powerful creator, was it um like just start off in Genesis page one, did it happen that way? Or was there a lot that could have been put in Genesis that wasn't put in Genesis. You know, the Bible is only like 1,500 pages, but God created everything. So it's going to take more than 1,500 pages. Like we, we need to get to the point, right? Mm-hmm. And so with this all being said, um, there's so much to learn about God. If you don't want a God, you can just be content with not having a God and go worship whatever is on this earth that satisfies you. That's fine. If you want a God, you can't prove there's a God, but you can start working towards the idea of there being a God. And then if that idea, it, sorry, but this kind of gets me when I think about it. You got to plant, oh man, you got to plant in your head the idea that there might be a God. Mm. Once that seed has been planted, you now act on that seed there might be a god okay if there might be a god how might i find him well let's talk about love let's talk about service let's talk about you know being a better person if your life is revolving around love service being a better person goals like then let's see what happens where where does your mind come to then we have to face this notion that like when you die where are you going and what's the afterlife existence like and and this is a big part of why i wrote the book here's the thing if atheism is correct and they can be right they might be right Mm -hmm. if atheism is correct when an atheist dies, he shuts his eyes. What's his end result? Nothing. It's the same as mine, same as yours, same as the guy over there. Everybody has the exact same end result. Okay. Live, eat, drink, be married, do whatever you want. The end result is always the same for everybody if atheism is right. And uh, so even if atheism is right, will I have a richer, better, fuller life if I live my life as if there is a God and that God has motivated me to help others to serve to um, in the Bible it says fulfill the measure of your creation which is basically have kids man was created to fulfill the measure of his creation have kids it's in Genesis um, so I'm going to have a little family so I, I, I live my life as if I'm a God-fearing man. I'm trying to help others, trying to be the best guy I can possibly be. I'm setting goals. Got my little family going. Um, if atheism is right, when I'm dead, I'm dead, and it didn't matter what I did. But is my life a little bit better, a little bit richer, because I was living as if there was a God? that makes sense? Mm-hmm. A lot of people have to ask themselves this question because typically what atheistic lives lead to is do what you want, when you want, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And this is this one strikes a bone with a lot of people. A lot of people, when I kind of get into this, they're like, oh, you're, you're, you no, know, atheism because of science. Science is why we, we don't believe there's a God. I personally think atheism exists because people are lazy and they don't want to be pushed out of their comfort zone. 
And if you can't prove there's a God, then you can't prove that there you can't prove that there is a God, and you also cannot prove that there is not a God, then we need to ask ourselves, well, what do we want? Do we want there to be no God? Or do we want there to be a God? If we want if we want a God, then we need to figure out, well, who is God and what would he expect of me? And most people would say, well, he probably wants me to be a nice guy, loving, caring. If there is no God, then really the key to life, if there is no God, and someone could debate me on this, I don't care. The key to life, if there is no God, is to have as much fun as you possibly can and die before the consequences catch up to you. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way I see it. I could be wrong. But... If I knew there there was no God, I'd be like, all right, I probably got average U.S. life expectancy, 78 years old. How much fun can I possibly have? Because when I die, it's, we're done. So let's go have fun. Whatever you think your fun is. Tear it up. Have fun. Um, but if there is a God, then we need to understand the fact that we're going to have to meet him one day. And when we do meet him, is it going to be a well done, thou good and faithful servant? Like, I gave you little hints of my existence, and you did a pretty darn good job of trying to figure things out. Or is it going to be a, I gave you a world, I gave you a body, there was a spirit in that body, you were on that earth, you could have done anything you wanted to do. And you never once concluded that there might be a higher power. And you never once thought that maybe I should thank that higher power for my existence. Maybe I should look to that higher power and ask that higher power for advice or guidance. And I think that'd be a pretty miserable experience to stand in front of the creator of all things and have to explain to him why you didn't care. And so back to this, like, is atheism right? We don't know. We can't prove either way. But I want to have a God, which means I'm going to start acting as if there is a God. So wanting a God is kind of planting the seed. Acting as if there probably is a God is what's going to constitute faith in that God. I'm now acting as if I truly believe there's a God. So first, let's go back to, I hope there's a God. I'm going to act as if there is one. That's now we're starting to talk about faith. Um, now what happens is, when you're hoping there's a God, when you're acting as if there is a God, you start to find out that there really is a God. But you can't prove it. But you know it. But I can't prove it. But I do know it. <laughs> and so we get into this like, who is he? How do we get to know him better? And I know it for myself. And that's really a very sweet and unique concept to know God to a degree. Because like I said earlier, we, we none of us really know him, but to know him to a degree. And how do I know him? Well, I know God is the great organizer. He also organized me, so I'm going to call him Father. So we've got a God. He's my Father. He's my Creator. Did He create the gene sequencing that all life comes from? my mind yeah did he create the heavens and the earth did he put the earth at just the right distance from the sun did he create a north and a south pole that shields us from radiation that's flying through space did he i, I just learned this not long ago did he tilt the earth at just the right axis because the right axis is what kind of creates those gravitational pulls did he put the moon to create the the tides and the weather patterns that we have that also helps create Earth. Um, there's a thing on what's the difference between Mars and Earth because they both could potentially be life, but there's a lot of little things. 
that Mars doesn't have. Hmm. So once again, the question basically kind of boils down to this. Is there a God? Who is God? Do I want a God? And how do I know if there really is a God? And when you start looking at it this way, it starts to make a lot of sense that like, yeah, I would, I do want a God. I, I do want to get out of my comfort zone and be a better person. This all starts to make a lot of sense. And, and another driving force for atheism, sorry, I haven't really talked in a while. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I'm, <laughs> so, I'm sucking everything in. Uh, another part of atheism is the simple fact that a lot of people don't want to have afterlife consequences. And they've been taught, and I don't know why this has become such a popular notion. They've been taught that if they don't live up to God's expectations, they will be sentenced to hell. And I think that notion is crazy, and, and, and I, don't, I wish we could look at it differently. I wish we could look at it in the fact that, like, if you make mistakes, which we all do, nobody's perfect. If you make mistakes, you'll be, you'll be all right. Because there's going to be a way that you can correct those mistakes. Um, if you understand and interpret God wrong, you'll be fine. Because you'll be able to figure out the true one and true God one day. Um, so I think a lot of people are confronted with this simple concept that like, if you don't understand God, if you don't live right, you're going to hell. Which I, I personally, I mean, call me out, call me a bad person, I don't believe in that. Now, a lot of people might then turn around and say, well, if you don't believe in a hell, then you can have a God and you can also do whatever you want. And I also have talked about how, like, not necessarily because I don't want to be that guy that's embarrassed when I'm standing in front of God and he's wondering why I live the way that I lived. So is there a hell or is there people who are, is there a hell or is there, souls that have to stand before God and, and feel really dumb. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know these answers, mm -hmm. but I know where I want to be. And that's a better person helping others, raising a, a nice little family. And hopefully when I stand before the judgment bar or stand before Christ, um, I will know that it's my God and that he's a forgiving God and that though I made mistakes, I'll be all right because my God knows me and loves me and, and we'll be all right. In your book, you mentioned that everybody has a unique relationship with God. Mm -hmm. According to the, the atheistic belief system, our lives have no purpose. Yeah. Do you believe that everybody's life has a purpose? Yeah. You mentioned earlier that, oh, I forget how you put it, but you said that we're all, something about us being God's creation. Let's just say this. If God is all powerful and created all things, I don't think he's a God full of mistakes. And he was the source of our creation. So what is our purpose? We may not fully know it right now. But God does. And I think my God's perfect. So there's a reason he created you, me, everybody. Mm. What that reason is, do we find out in this life? Do we find out in the next life? I don't know. But we're, we're the our destiny is is coming, and we'll we'll get to know the answers of why our <clears throat> why our perfect God created us. Because I think He is perfect, and and I don't really see how to debate that. To be honest with you, we're here for a reason. Yeah, you mentioned goals. What's the next one? Sorry, goal so the goal just kind of like oh, let's just take care of the rest of this book here for a second. You got Ax six more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Access to information. 
the access to information basically goes along the lines of is when we look back in history, a lot of people fell into religious beliefs just because of what they were told, but they didn't really have any other information otherwise. So a lot of churches, I don't want to pick on any, but there were a lot of churches throughout history that wouldn't let the average citizen read the scriptures. You had to be a priest. You had to be higher up. And, and then you got to read the scriptures. But if you're just a peasant, just this is what we're telling you. Just believe us. Does that make sense? And so yeah. you got to have information if you want to make right decisions. Mm-hmm. So uh, access to information is insanely important because otherwise you're just believing what people tell you. Well, today we have a lot of access to information in various different areas. Yeah. Most people don't take advantage of uh, the readily available information. Why do you think people um, don't take advantage of that? Do you think it's just easier for people to just go with the flow, go along with things, not educate themselves on politics or any other thing? They just, you know, why do you think people do that? Lazy. I think a lot of times once you figure out, once you figure something else out, once you figure anything out, there's a responsibility behind it, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think a lot of people would say avoid politics because if they really knew everything going on in politics, they'd have to become passionate about their political opinions. And all of a sudden it's like, I mean, if I just kind of take a back seat, then I don't have to care as much. But religion is the same way. Mm -hmm. If you're like, well, if I knew there was a God, I'd kind of be dumb to not want to figure out more. To be God-like, to live. live, There's a responsibility. With information comes responsibility. And if you have a good life, you're enjoying your life, you're having fun, it doesn't even matter. It could just be a really pure, simple little life. You go to work nine to five, you come home to your family, you go fishing on the weekends. You don't want to know if there's problems and if you're the one that needs to be a part of causing, creating solutions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just easy to... Ignore information, especially if you're just happy doing what you're doing. Okay. So, on to the next one? On to the next one. Okay, an open mind. The open mind basically comes back to when I was on my mission, I said I'd get in a lot of, you, I, I want to call them arguments, but for better terms, maybe I'll say debates or just discussions with people about God and church, religions. Um, it'd be really narrow-minded and this goes for MMA as well to just be like well I'm a wrestler and I'm gonna wrestle and beat everybody with wrestling well as you learn more about fighting you realize that wrestling is great but it, you need more than just wrestling and so one of these kind of paralleling principles is like well yeah there's a lot that's really good about maybe your current belief but there's more than what you know and what you believe so you have to have an open mind. If you don't have an open mind to listen to somebody else, then whatever you currently believe, that's where you're stuck. You're not going to grow. No, you can't. The closed minded you are, your, your, your growth is basically postponed. Absolutely. Okay. And then on the next one is humility. So let's say it like this. If you have an open mind, you're ready to listen, you're ready to understand, you're ready to have a conversation, not a debate, if something sinks within you and you're like, you know, I was talking to this guy, I read this thing and that just made a lot of sense. It'd be really easy to be like, but no, 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 but I'm still right over here. Mm -hmm. Which happens a lot. (laughs) That happens a lot to people (laughs) in all things. You know what I mean? A lot of old timers are getting fired from their jobs because they can't pick up this new technology. Yeah. Um, And so we we see it in all sorts of things. Humility is a simple fact, in my opinion. Humility is a simple fact that when you find out something's better, you get with the program and you do it better. You do it more efficiently, more effectively. And so humility, open mind is is learning it. And humility is more like acting on it. Being like, no, this is better than what I was here. Mm -hmm. So I got to get with the program. Okay, cool. And then the other one is learning from others. And that kind of touches on... And this on, is five, right? Yeah, five. Five, learning from others. And that kind of touches on 
what we've already talked about, you know, being able to have an open mind, listen to people, have the humility to, to do something about it. Um, but with that being said, and I get into this learning from others, it's like, well, everybody will give you an opinion on something. And when they give you that opinion on that thing, um, are they right or are they wrong? And so when I talk about learning from others, I'm kind of also touch on, is it a trusted source? And so, because you could have two trusted sources that are com completely disagreeing with each other. And with two trusted sources that completely disagree, what, what do we learn? And so there's still a lot to be learned and a lot of navigation that we need, even though we're learning from others. But we all... You can't disagree with the fact that, like, if you learn from others, you're going to learn at a faster rate. Let them make the mistakes. Let them overcome the problems. And then when they sit you down and say, you know what, when I was your age, blah, 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 this is what happened. And then it's like, well, yeah, I don't want to suffer through that. So, but is it a trusted source? Yeah. So, once again, learning from others, learning to navigate who you can trust, who you can't trust. And also, um, once it is a trusted source, how do we figure out, how do we go about honoring it and also um, do what they recommended? And so There's a, a book called Principles by Ray Dalio. And he's like this, um, I don't know, this guy that's like a billionaire and he, he advises companies. And one of the things that he mentions, he mentioned this book, he mentions that he doesn't have the answers, but what you want to do is, is that you want to increase your probability for success. And the only way right. to do that is by doing exactly what you said, speaking to people, having different resources, and then you'll see that there's a relationship, there's a correlation between all that information. And once you've had a lot of information, you had enough information, you're going to see like which things um, show up the most, and that's going to put you in a position to be most successful. Right. You know, so it's basically, it's not necessarily the truth, but it gets you the closest to the truth. I love that concept. You know, so. And, and back to fighting, like, what's a what's a concept kind of going on that that's going to help you in almost every fight? Well, typically speaking, if you throw more punches, you're probably going to win. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But it's not every time. It's just the probability, right? Mm -hmm. If it goes as judge's scorecard, they're not going to be like, well, this punch affected him but his punch didn't affect him and that was the third punch in the third round no the judges are basically just looking at chaos going i think this guy's in charge of the chaos and this guy's kind of become an innocent victim you see mm -hmm. what i'm saying so when it comes to probabilities I, i'm big on the fact that like just do more um well when it comes to fighting throw more punches throw more kicks move your head more move your feet a little bit more um Put up more defense, put out more offense, and uh, and eventually we're just going to start running away from our opponent as far as breaking him down and hopefully us not getting broken down. Mm -hmm. And then when, when you shake it all out, without e extenuating circumstances, um, a random wild haymaker punch lands. You know, I mean, this stuff happens. Yeah. But as far as probabilities are concerned, you're kind of stacking all the odds in your favor so i love that i haven't heard like if you take in a lot of information you can now start to put odds in your favor i like that mm -hmm. concept a lot yeah and then the six is testing the information personally and and this is this is where we we have to go back to like love and charity right because how much information can a person acquire and if we acquire all that information how long now do we have to take to experiment with every little thing and the fact of the matter is we don't have enough time in our life to do it. We just don't. Yeah. So we need to test information, but the, the key is we've got the goals, access to information, open mind, and we've talked a lot about all this stuff, but now we've got to test the information. What do we test? And, and my conclusion has been love's got to be up there. Service, charity, helping others. If that's your focus, that'll get you going in the right direction. Um, humility, understanding the fact that you don't know it all. Like this, so there's a lot of these things, and I think most 
anybody from any religion could sit in this room with us right now and be like, well, yeah, I mean, we agree, they agree, love, service, helping others, humility. Um, like, let's, let's zero it in on those few simple things rather than taking all these different traditions that all these different religions have had and say, well, I'm going to try this tradition. Next, I'll try this tradition. Next, I'll try this tradition. Um, we don't have enough time in our lives to, yeah. to, to do that. So, <coughs> One second. <coughs> My bad. And that actually leads into the next one is not wasting time on useless traditions. And matter of fact, I might have might have put them together. Testing the information personally. Yeah. And then not wasting time on useless traditions. I kind of read myself right into it. Yeah, simply put, we just don't have time to, and wrestling does this, and, and I'm not going to say anything bad about any martial arts, but we got to remember the goals, right? If your goal mm. is to be an MMA fighter, and you go into a dojo, and they're focusing on breaking boards, like... I get exactly what it, you're saying. It's my experience that breaking boards is fun and cool. If that's your goal, to break boards, then go break those boards. But if your goal is to be an MMA fighter, I would recommend practicing footwork, practice pumping your jabs and head movement. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? But somewhere, somehow, some martial arts have gotten there. And breaking boards is just a, an example of a lot of things that don't have a whole lot to do with fighting. And someone could be like, well, if you can break a board, you can break a guy's head. Yes and no. In my experience, whenever I tried to hit a guy hard, I ended up losing. And whenever I was kind of, there's kind of a flow state. There's kind of a zone. Um, Max Holloway, go watch his last fight. It, it blew my mind. Um, very inspirational to me. Where he was just kind of putting out volume. Pop, 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 pop. Exactly what we're talking about. He put out so many numbers. His opponent just couldn't keep up with him. And so, um, and Max Holloway never knocked him out. He just put out numbers. He put out volume. He just kept pumping that jab. He was ripping elbows, knees, side kicks, turn kicks. He's doing it all. And he had the energy, the athleticism to just keep putting that pressure on. And he didn't finish. I couldn't believe I, I feel bad now. I don't remember the guy's name that he fought. But he put so much pressure on him that I, I couldn't believe the guy was still standing, to be honest with you. Mm. And uh, what we learned from that is, like, just – keep always putting yourself in position in the right position, doing the right things. Oh, what I was getting at is the breaking boards. Holloway didn't throw anything where he might possibly break a board. He just kept throwing those punches, kept throwing those punches, stick and move, stick and move, stick and move. Mm -hmm. um, every time I could try to hit someone as hard as I can, and that's usually where I'm letting my emotions get a little too caught up into the fight. Hold my breath, bite down on my mouthpiece, bring that punch way back and miss you know what i mean well i missed him so i better throw the next one even harder and it's another miss and then all of a sudden the fight's getting away from me mm -hmm. and uh if i were to take power off those strikes and just go straight from my head straight out boom his head's come right back my head you know pop pop we're in we're out we're moving there's not a lot of power in that strike but it's getting a lot done that's a mental so, shift i was watching um an interview between Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson recently. Yeah. And Evander, he was talking about his fight against George Foreman. And he said, George Foreman, he hits you with a lot of stones and bricks. But he's yeah. like, you know, I don't have any stones, but I got a lot of rocks. And I just kept going <laughs> with all these little rocks at him. Yeah. You know, and in order to like, and my favorite fighter is uh, James Tony, and he does the same thing. But uh -huh. what it is that to, to be able to be in that mindset, you have to be really relaxed and yeah, confident and believing in those little, yeah. You temper a little bit. Yeah, because you're, you're thinking, like, I, I've been there. You're thinking, like, I got to hit him hard or I got to get him back. And that mindset is what gets you tired. I did that against your guy, you yeah. know, when he was throwing all those punches. And I just threw a, a hard right, and I was winded after I missed. <laughs> I was just like, oh, my God. Yeah. And so it makes some logical sense if you can break a board. I mean, you yeah. watch these, and I don't want to call any martial arts out and say they're useless. They're not useless. It's what's your goal. If you want to break boards, find a martial art that will teach you how to break boards. If you want to be able to do a – spinning backflip kick then find yeah. a martial art that will teach you how to do that but if you want to win fights 
look at people who are winning fights. What are they doing? And, and typically, you can start to now narrow it down. And, and if we go back to finding God, uh, you can talk to people who claim to know God. What are they doing? That's a good start. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so um, people who are successful in something, reliable source, we kind of talked about that earlier. But we now have a, an idea of what we should be testing. And so it kind of comes all full circle as far as we start to gain ground on which direction we should move. I'm glad you made that point. With, with God. Glad you made that point because you could apply that to anything even outside fighting. Don't waste your time on things that don't work. Absolutely. Find out, find people who are successful in those specific areas. Mimic what they do. Don't try to rebuild uh, the will to what they say. Mm -hmm. Find, find basically people who, who do what you want, who do what you do, who do what you want to do. They're experts in it and then get a good foundation in it for a while before you start to become your creative and do your own thing. Absolutely. But, and all the greatest fighters in the world have maybe their own style. Even if we just take boxing, which is just boxing. It's punching, yeah. not getting punched. But every boxer has a different style. They're yeah. good at different things, which basically kind of goes back to you asked me earlier about like how we all have a different relationship with God. That's fine. We all have your relationship with God is like your fingerprint. It's different. Um, somebody focus on this, another guy focus on that, another guy focus on this, and that's fine. What once again, I think the important thing is when we do meet God, how is our effort? Because we're going to be wrong, we're, we're going to assume things that were right that were not right. But what was our effort? Like, I think our effort is far more important than being perfect. And I really think that's what life is really all about: is what is our effort towards being a good person and, and helping others. I mean, I, ca I can't say it enough. If you're not helping others, you're wasting your time. And, and you got to figure out how to help others because there, there's something to be said about just giving people money. There's something to be said about being a friend, putting your arm around someone, inviting them to do something with you, uh, being very generous with uh, what you've learned in life, helping people get on the right path, um, and, and also – literally just maybe buying them something you know i mean there's a lot of different ways to help people that kind of goes back to what you said about love you know um, you can feel it when you're being selfish or you're in a negative mindset it's a loss of energy mm -hmm. but when you help people yeah. it like it it, it it fuels you yeah. you know but anyways eric thank you for being here i'm going to um, have a link in the description of this video thank to you. your book fighting to find god it's a great book I'm sure you'll, um, I'm sure anybody who's ever watching this, they should definitely check it out. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, man, this is one of my best podcasts. Thank you for being here. Well, thank All you right? for having me. Yep. Peace.